Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've got a, a, a lovely, lovely lady with me today who we actually met by accident in a soundabout way, in a, in a strange kind of way, through Google Maps, if we'll come back to that in a second. I've got the Su lovely Suzanne Lawson with me today, who is an inspirational lady with an amazing story, amazing backstory, who I think will resonate with an awful lot of people, not just ladies and girls, etc., which we'll talk about in a second, but I think with everybody going through any kind of trauma or disruption in their lifestyle. Um, Suzanne's aim is to spread the word about the power of holistic living to support those who've experienced ongoing pain and or trauma, unfortunately. Uh, by utilising the power of our own good choices, we can make simple and easy lifestyle changes that can have a profound effect on our daily living. Welcome, Suzanne. Lovely to Welcome. see you. Welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Lovely to see you. You uh, too. I would like to take you, our listeners right the way back to sure. the very beginning with you. I want to know about mm -hmm what your lifestyle was like what what was your upbringing like what was your you know what did you have your aspirations in your life what did you want to do in your life um as a child I was quite a bit of a loner really I did like being on my own and that idea of you know when you go on holiday and your parents say or oh, go and play with the children it used to fill me with dread I used to just love playing with my dolls and just being on my own and sort of just lying in the grass watching the clouds go by really that really resonated with me and I always had a fascination of maps and the globe just absolutely loved looking at this massive big universe as it were and I guess in those days in the 70s the, the world seemed a much smaller place than it does now and I did sort of have this idea of travel and kind of just being with different people and meeting different people. Um, I then did want to be a writer, journalist. Sadly, again, in the times when I went to school, if you weren't at the top of the class, you didn't go to university or anything like that. And I was kind of told, no, you just need to just get a job. So that's what I did. <laughs> but going back to childhood, I had quite a happy childhood, really. It was quite steady. Um, but I did sort of begin with trauma at about the age of eight when I fractured, dislocated and chipped the elbow. Um, and that involved a lot of operations on the well, it, it ultimately involved in having an elbow replacement. Um, and that was quite traumatic in itself because it involved doctors coming to the scene who had to try and figure out how to move me because the elbow had come right through um, the skin. So that was quite, was quite horrible. And again, in the times when there was no mobile phones, so no one could get in touch with my mum. I was taken to hospital on my own, which was pretty scary for a nine year old. Um, and I can just remember nurses being so lovely and nurses having really crusty uniforms and hats <laughs> in the days when there was hats on the nurses' heads. Um, and that was very, very painful, that, that elbow. But do you know, I never said it was. And I think that might have been a very, the start of being silent to pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is huge yeah. to a lot of people. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think, as you say, back in the 70s, early 80s, children were seen and not heard a lot of the time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It was a quite a difficult time uh, mm -hmm. economically, I think, as well, um, mm -hmm. for a lot of families. And then sort of leaving school, what did you go into then, Suzanne? Uh, leaving school, I went to work for a mortgage broker's uh, as office junior. I loved, I'm a bit sad, it's something, I loved doing things like the filing and having everything all organised. You could always find everything in all my files because obviously I had paper files. Um, I used to make up all the new files, all the new mortgages and 
everything. I, all I wanted to be able to do was to be a, a mortgage advisor. That was what I'd aspired to be because I just grew up with these people. And I did do all my qualifications, but ultimately it was just the completely wrong thing for me to do. Right. Um, and I think I gained my confidence because I ended up working for a company and I got bullied quite a bit. I didn't really fit in. Um, and I hated it, absolutely hated the job. I used to dread going into work. And I came out of work one day and I went to a phone box and I rang my dad and I was crying on the phone. I mean, I was probably like 19 at the time. And I'll never forget what he said, just leave. Yeah. And I did, and I never went back. Really? Uh -huh. No, and that, those days you could just pick up temporary work. Yeah. And I uh, registered with a local agency and they just kept giving me work all the time. I got paid weekly, so it was brilliant. I could just go and blow my wages every week. <laughs> and I just loved it because I could be at some place for two weeks, some place for a month. Yeah. And I would just gain that confidence. A lot of the time I would be like a receptionist or a secretary um, and just... It was, an, I, I like the transient part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That idea that I didn't get too comfortable. It didn't get too boring. There was always lots of questions. I used to always ask lots of questions. Um, and I like that. And it was funny because a few times people would offer me like a permanent contract and I would decline. Yeah. yeah. I just love that idea of moving on and, and meeting new people and starting all over again. And kind of gaining new insights into, into all sorts of new things that you'd maybe not thought about pre-leaving school. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I worked from like a builder's merchant to a chemical plant yeah. to working for a barrister in a home, just sitting, yeah. doing work for her one to one. So it's all very different work. And then ultimately, eventually, I did end up in employment law. Right. Um, worked in that for a long time and then became office manager of a law firm. Loved it at the time. It was right for me at the time. Um, but then the opportunity came to get out and I left. Uh -huh. And was there a particular turning point where things in your life, how can I say it, took a downhill a stroll or a downhill dive yeah what was well your i suppose point? so suppose from around the age of i would say probably about 11 12 i started with these pains which nobody knew what they were okay and they were at the time we didn't even know how often they were happening and then it would they'll be getting worse. So I would be sent to the doctor and then the doctor would send us to hospital. I think I was in hospital about four or five times. And eventually, when I was probably about 13, they were like, oh, it's just growing pains. Don't worry. By the time you're, old, by the time you're um, old enough to have a family, once you've had a baby, they'll go away. So in my head, that kind of stuck for year, forever really until one day you think whoa you shouldn't really be saying that to people mm -hmm. so in my head I was told by professionals you're just going to have to learn to live with that pain until you have children by the time I hit 15 16 I thought everyone else's monthly period was the same as me okay. because we didn't talk about it I couldn't understand how these people were like playing netball going out having fun and because once we charted it we realized it was every month wow. I would bleed for around two weeks I would be in pain for about two and a half weeks so a week out of a month was like the nice time Gosh, me. And it just manifested. And then as I got into like my 20s, I kind of saw the trigger point. So alcohol, I did smoke at the time. But actually smoking used to help in a way. I now know why, because of the breathing. So I've now obviously discovered that breathing helps with pain. But at the time, you don't, you didn't know no, that. Different, yeah. 
Um, and obviously as well, nutrition. So I got to a point where I realized if I ate a pizza and chocolate, I would be so ill. Um, but it's knowing how to live for you, your body and how to understand what your body is trying to tell you. And for years and years and years, I didn't know. I couldn't. I just kept relying on the professionals yeah. who obviously didn't know either. And how um, long did this go on for, Suzanne, in all? Uh, I wasn't diagnosed until I was 32. Oh. And the only reason I was eventually given the support and the help that I needed was because from around the age of 28 to 32, oh. I was trying to have a family and couldn't. Okay. Now, previous to this in the 90s, I had been constantly going to the library because we didn't have Google. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So I would go off to the library and get medical books out and just think, I know there is something wrong with me, but why why isn't anyone telling me what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And I had found this thing called endometriosis which is where the lining of the womb fixates onto other areas in the body. And it kind of resonated with me. Everything that they were saying, I was like, it must be this. And I kept going back saying, do you think it's this? Oh, well, probably not. And then it wasn't until I said, I need some, I've got to have some help. And we went in, had a procedure where they put the camera through the belly button and when he told me, he said, it's it's very severe. I'm really sorry. I burst into tears, not because of what I had, but because now I knew yeah. I had a name mm -hmm. that I could say, this is what's wrong with me. Like, I haven't been making this up. I mean, for years, I used to have half of my wardrobe with normal clothes and half of my wardrobe with maternity clothes and the amount of times people would say, oh, when are you due? Which was heartbreaking because obviously, I, you know, I was wanting a family. Um, so, yeah, so once I knew what it was, that led me to, obviously, I was told there's no cure. There's nothing we can do. There's no tablets. We can't operate because it's so bad. It's all around your bowel. So really, goodbye. That was it. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. What was your um, initial thought with that then? What was, obviously, a family comes into it and things? Um, despair, really. Um, I mean, they did say we can try IVF, which I did go down that route, which I hated every minute of. And I would never put anyone off doing IVF but for me it was just everything about it was so obviously unnatural yeah. the drugs were horrendous it just really didn't sit well with me at all and I think I went into it with a really negative mindset and it didn't work mm -hmm. and that's yeah. why it didn't work because I didn't believe it was going to work um and as I was recovering from the IVF kind of it's one of those moments where you just it's like a light bulb moment where I just sat there and thought this can't be my life I, this ca I cannot live this life of pain not just physically but mentally as well I've got to do something about it and my first port of call was to see someone about my bowel okay. because my bowel just wasn't working properly I could go for two weeks without going to the toilet. Bless you. Um, and that was the roller coaster. That kind of went there and I felt the best. I had a, um, I can't remember what you call it. Chronic uh, irrigation. Like, yes, mm -hmm. chronic irrigation, yeah. And I literally felt the best I'd ever felt in my adult life. Wow. Wow. Like literally as if I had cleared everything out. Mm -hmm. um and that manifested into she actually said 
I reckon, I, what, have you heard of reflexology? And I hadn't. Mm. Um, and she said, I really think you would really benefit from it. I was on quite a low wage at the time and I couldn't, there wasn't very many people in the Northeast who did it. Yeah. And they were charging quite a lot of money for it. And as with all these things, you kind of think, oh, I don't really want to spend that much money if it doesn't work. Yeah, it's so difficult. But also, it's that mindset as well of, you can't just go for something once and expect it to work. Mm -hmm. um, so she suggested I contact the local college who would have students going through their studies and who always want models to work on That's right. so I was literally going once a week for like 15 pound for an hour's treatment wow. and I got the same person every week and then obviously when she qualified I employed her <laughs> um, and that was the first kind of physical connection I had with another kind of realm as it were yeah I kind of was introduced to how to relax. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know how to relax. I didn't even know what that meant. Yeah. Um, we think by watching TV, we're relaxed. We're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Suzanne, what a journey. It, it, it really resonates with me and I hope it resonates with, with the listeners as well because it's that, it, it, it's that sentence that we hear time and time again where... You, because we're not getting, I hate the word, diagnosis, but because we're not getting an answer, yes, there's something wrong with me. Well, what is? And because we put so much energy and emphasis into a mm -hmm. specialist that says, tell me what the hell is going on with me? Because mm -hmm. I, I'm not crazy. I'm not losing my mind. There is some, people know their own bodies. Yeah. Uh, and I think, um, I, I can certainly resonate with with your story the same the same as obviously as mine. Uh, leading on from from the first sort of touch into alternative therapies like reflexology, where did you where did you find yourself thereafter? Um, so I've been having that for quite a while, and then I started reading lots of things about like essential oils, mm. you know, back uh, remedy, back flower remedies. Um, different uh, vitamins and minerals and it was almost like it had opened up this huge Pandora's box and then you kind of like oh my god there's so much to learn like where do we start and just even dipping the toe into the history of reflexology was amazing in itself and understanding how the feet connect with the body and and I would sit and like look at my foot myself and have a press and see how I felt and just having that open mind really yeah. and then by chance again like how I met you I met a lady who was a Reiki master and teacher and I was doing some work for her and we decided rather than use payment in terms of money we would do payment in terms of teaching so she put she took me through my first Reiki level one. Um, I didn't really get it at first. I, like everyone else in the class was like, oh yeah, I feel this, I feel that. And I was like, no, I don't feel anything at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but I stuck with it. And, and, and I think for me, a lot of what I do, I, um, I have to really immerse myself in it and read about it and practice it and really kind of understand it before I can tell people that anything works yeah because yeah. you've got to feel it you've got to know what it yeah. what it means what that resonates with you inside um and then not long after doing the Reiki I injured my back and I was in absolute agony and I went to see the doctor and she suggested yoga <laughs> which like now I just think that was quite intuitive of her in those days and this was sort of what 15 years ago now um 
and I went to my first yoga class. I was a member of a gym that I never went to because it just used to sound good that I've got a gym membership. And so I rang up, do you do yoga? Yeah, we do yoga every night of the week. So put my name down, went, hated it, hated every single second of it. I was like, and I smoked at the time. And I remember coming out of the class, getting in the car, driving home, never going back to that again. Never, never, never. Got all the way home, made a cup of tea and sat down and realised for the first time in forever, I hadn't had a cigarette. And I hadn't thought about having a cigarette. Okay. So I went back the next day to have another go. And it was that breath connection of the inhale, exhale. Wow. Which replaced smoking. And, and I didn't, I still didn't really connect with it. I was uh -huh. quite overweight, obviously my bad back, but I just, there was something. And to this day, I don't know what it was. I just kept going back and going back and going back. And I think a lot of the people in the class were really skinny. There were ex-dancers, they looked very glamorous, they were wearing their makeup. <laughs> and I just kept thinking, no, don't look at them. Mm -hmm. Just just think of you. And funnily enough, obviously, years later, I realised that yoga does translate as union, but it's the union of yourself. So it's the union between your body, your mind and your soul. So when you're on that yoga mat, it's simply about you and I just kept going and going and going and then the, I, I decided I was very brave roll on about mm, eight years later and I signed up to go on a yoga retreat on my own I'd never done anything like that before and that was the first time I'd ever meditated properly and that was it that was the journey that like wow on the journey of this is definitely working this is this is what I need this is my oxygen yeah this is it this is this is filling yes. full of the life that you deserve and, and yes. are meant to have and it's yes. such a big turnaround but there's so many little things when you listen back to your story there's so many little things that have triggered or has just caught the the wheels of balance off and, and caused them little things it's all about you now uh, uh, years ago as well 15 13 years ago going on that yoga retreat even of building it bringing everything back into a balance for your life and in about you like you say it's about you and your body and your soul mm -hmm. um it, it's it's it honestly it's so fascinating to to learn about somebody's life the way that you've that you've described how things have happened in that and then you went on to do your yoga t teacher training I did yes um never ever ever thought I would teach yoga could never see myself doing it and it's this is really this is when you kind of see yourself on a path it's really strange where I used to live was probably about half an hour drive away from where I live now and I used to go to a yoga class religiously three four times a week every week for years to the same teacher in the community centre, in the village where I live now. You see, isn't it bizarre? <laughs> it's so and that, bizarre. And, and then that was where I ended up teaching yoga. And it's just in the same room oh my as that teacher. And weirdly, I always remember someone saying, that teacher saying to me, eventually you'll move on to a different teacher because I won't be able to give you what you need. But the ultimate goal for a yoga teacher is to have at least one yogi in that tribe who becomes a teacher. There you are. So oh that it just... Oh, my God. Uh -huh. and Suzanne, what a journey. It, it's just so weird. All the houses that I looked at and I literally walked into this one and was like, yeah, this is it. This is home. It's just, when you know... I know there's a lot of people interested in, in fortune telling and things like this. It's another line I'm going down now, but it, it, it's... It's amazing when we don't know 
what the path leads or which way the path's actually going to go. But however, yeah. when that path comes back on itself in a roundabout way, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you're on the right path. Yeah. And, and, and it's it's just absolutely fascinating. Now, now I've got all your details here, uh, Suzanne, about you've got a website and you've also yeah. got an, an email and you're also on Instagram and Facebook as well. Incidentally, for the listeners, um, all Suzanne's information will be linked um, in the uh, show notes at the end of the podcast so you can contact Suzanne. Um, and Suzanne will be able to take any questions anybody has on the life story that Suzanne's explained. Any Anybody's got any queries or worries would like to talk to Suzanne about this. Uh, and also the new website, I believe, will be up and running next year, but you can yes. subscribe to this one and it will be... This one at the minute, yeah. I'm not really doing anything updated on this. But it's All it is at the moment is just a blog because I've stopped obviously with COVID and then my own ill health, um, I've stopped teaching yoga now for the, the time being. Okay. So I am creating um, a new website, which is going to have um, a holistic shop, online shop, and some great online training as well. Oh, that's There'll be fantastic. some free training and some paid training on there as well. So just trying to get all that and pull all that together. Oh, it, it's absolutely fantastic. And um, I can't wait for next year's website because I think it'd be super interesting. Um, also YouTube as well. You have a YouTube channel as well, which will be updated, will it? Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. Suzanne, I can't thank you enough um, for A, for coming into my life. Um, uh, the way we met was uh, through, as I said at the very beginning, through Google Maps. Um, uh, and that was Suzanne on holiday who'd come to visit myself. Yeah. It was fabulous. Amazing. It was. It, it, and whoever's listening to this the, there's a reason why you're listening to both Suzanne uh, more Suzanne than myself but there's a reason why you need to listen to this today because I think the information that Suzanne's got about her life story is super inspirational and it will resonate with so many people on all levels all levels I would love to take this opportunity Suzanne to say thank you so much for your time and your energy and your love you're um, welcome I hope to speak to you again very soon Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. Thank you. Namaste.